archery, indoor rowing, wheelchair basketball. These are just three of the sports that military veterans from 15 countries will compete in at this year's Invictus Games. Orlando is hosting the 2016 Games, the second time this international event is being staged. Join us as an organizer of the Games and an American athlete discuss this groundbreaking event, next on Metro Center Outlook. Hello, I'm Diane Trees. Our first guest today is Ken Fisher, a real estate developer based in Manhattan. He's also co-CEO of the 2016 Invictus Games. Ken, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Tell us about the Invictus Games, the date, the location, who participates. The Games will be held at ESPN Wide World of Sports at the Walt Disney uh, Resorts uh, Complex, uh, May 8th through the 12th, uh, just a couple of weeks from now. Uh, it will, as you say, uh, is 15 countries, 500 competitors, and, and they're competitors. I don't, I don't refer to them as wounded warriors or injured athletes or injured veterans. I refer to them as, as competitors now. Uh, they've, they've come a long way and they've earned that, uh, that distinction. So it's nice to be a part of that uh, and to watch it for myself. Now this is the second Invictus Games. Yes. So the first set was London. Is this bigger? Yes, they're bigger. They are, uh, well, there's 15 countries as of now. We're not sure. One of those countries actually is Iraq. We're not sure if Iraq is going to be able to send a, uh, and even if they did, it would be a small team. Uh, so we're still not sure. So we're going to go back to 14, which is still bigger, by the way, because the original were 13. Uh, and we will have 500 competitors, uh, regardless of whether there's 14 or 15 nations. How did the Invictus Games come about? How did they start? Actually started, uh, the, the birth of the Invictus Games started around 2010 with the American Warrior Games. We decided, uh, the, the Pentagon, the Department of Defense decided that adaptive sports would be a very powerful tool uh, in the rehabilitation process. You know, these men and women had a 95% battlefield survivor rate. So they were living through wounds that would have been fatal in previous conflicts. But that meant longer hospital stays and longer rehab, uh, where my other foundation, Fisher House, plays such an important role. Uh, so the rehabilitation was such, and remember, these, the nature of these wounds were such that, that these men and women were probably being told what they would never be able to do again. Uh, and then uh, comes adaptive sports and the warrior games, and all of a sudden, competition is back in their lives. And, you know, that's, that confidence, that swag, is, as, the, uh, as the kids say today, uh, you know, is back in their step. And, and you know, they, to, to, to raise your hand and volunteer uh, to, to defend this nation and, and 14 others, uh, you know, takes a certain quality of person. And I, I would wager that there's a certain amount of competitiveness and, and that spirit within them. So this is just rekindling something that may have been lost for a while. How did Prince Harry get involved with things? Well, back in, in 2013, uh, the Great Britain, the British were, were invited. And Prince Harry came along. He's a two-tour combat veteran uh, in Afghanistan. So. When he goes to a military event, he goes as a veteran. So that's right away, that's, that gives that a lot of credibility. Uh, and, um, and, and he saw the games and was so enamored with it that decided to take it back to the UK and make it international. And so the way they kept politics out to determine how many countries would, would compete was limited to who fought together, who with boots on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's how we I determined see. the number of countries. Now, you've already announced the 2017 location for the games. Are you surprised how quickly this is building in popularity and size? No, I'm not. But I will say that 
you know, that, that I think that this nation and other nations uh, owe it to these men and women not to forget the sacrifices uh, that they have made. And not, but not only them, also the, the sacrifices that their families have made. You know, very few of us realize the burden on the military family, especially at the most stressful times, is when their loved one is, in, is requiring hospitalization. What does Invictus mean? And Unconquered. What do you hope to convey using that word in, in the title of the games? That these men and women may have come back, you know, a little bit different, but that their spirit is still the same. So uh, a, a man or a woman might have given an arm uh, or a leg to their nation, or they might have been burned or, or what have you, or, they, or they, they have a psychological or an unseen wound uh, so they've come back a little different. So uh, the, the physical and the mental aspects both need to be addressed. Without question. And, and so the spirit of that, that there's nothing that they can't do, there's, is, it becomes very, very relevant. And that's why Invictus, Unconquered, you know, the Invictus spirit. That's a beautiful title for it. Now, the Invictus Games is the only international adaptive sports event that's, that's held. What's the advantage of being able to bring these competitors, these veterans, from all over the world to one location? Well, I think there's enormous uh, advantages. Number one is that the families, you know, have experiences that only they know. And, and, and the, the athletes themselves, uh, you know, they have commonality of experience. And I think the sharing of that can be therapeutic. Uh, at the same time, it can be informative. In other words, one family may, may have discovered something that another family may not know about. And you know, there's so much of, you know, of what, uh, of, 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 the, of the cutting edge, you know, techniques and technologies and so forth come from this nation. So many nations don't have a VA. Uh, so with all of its faults and so forth, we still have a VA. Uh, and, it's, and it still provides world-class health care. It's important for these nations. And by the way, one of the things that will be offered at the games will be a symposium on the unseen wounds uh, as it relates to the military family. And so a lot of, you'll, you'll hear a lot of, of things that, that perhaps you've, you've never heard before. So you're embracing the veterans and the families. Um, and with the commonality that you mentioned of bringing the other countries, there is, you know, the, the challenges are the same. We're all people we're all people that's that's right but certain uh, certain of us have been through experiences that that are very difficult to convey they're very difficult to um, you know to, to establish commonality so when when a, when an American civilian looks at these men and women they have to look at them in a way that you know what you did something that only one percent of your brothers and sisters in this country did and you know what, we owe, we owe you. We owe it to, to make sure that you're taken care of. You know, the other thing that, that I think is important, and I've been saying this a great deal, is that these games can also serve another purpose. You know, we've all heard about the suicide rate. We've all heard about, you know, the psychological trauma and, and what it does to the individual, drugs and alcohol and so forth. If we can get one of those veterans at home to watch what's going on in Orlando and see what is possible, that maybe they, they still have that stigma associated with the psychological wound, and they say, you know what, if they can do it, so can I, and we can keep one of them from, from substance abuse. If we can keep one of them from, from all of the other you know, from, from, from this, the, the, the outgrowth of these horrible psychological wounds, and they're every bit as debilitating as the physical, then we've done what we set out to do. So this is not only oriented, though, to the veterans. How do you think these games will help, hopefully help foster uh, a, a more communication or an understanding between civilian populations and veterans? Is there a gap there, you think, that needs yeah, to be bridged? I do. I think there is, and I think it's, it's, it's nobody's fault. I just think that 
It's difficult because when you see somebody who's given an arm or who's given a leg or who's been hit by an IED and, and has been burned and, and they're horrific, you know, it's difficult to, you know, I think that the tendency is to walk on eggshells. You know, this is, this population here is, I, I believe, the third largest veterans population in the entire country. Uh, and I don't, you know, because I'm, I'm from New York, although I do have a place down in Fort Lauderdale, I do consider Florida my second home. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how it is here. I, I haven't had enough time to, to see it. And, I, and, and because my first kind of initiation into this was through Fisher House, the Fisher House Foundation, I see families at the beginning of the process, and I very rarely see uh, what happens at the end of the process, you know, when they've done with their rehabbing, when they're out there competing and out there working again and making a difference. So, but I do, I do think that there's a gap and I think that, that the more people that get on the ground and talk to these men and women and realize that, that they're the same, the only thing that they did was they raised their right hand and they, they, they offered to, with their lives if necessary, to protect this nation. Now you and your family, you have a long history of working with veterans in the military. Why is this so important to you? I didn't serve. I didn't wear the uniform. Uh, I, I came of age shortly after Vietnam ended. But I remember, uh, because they were my, in a sense, my older brothers went to Vietnam. Hard times. Yeah, and, and, and it, was, it was horrible to watch and it, and it stayed with me. And, but I see these men and women, you know, and, and this is a very special group of people. It was begun by my late uncle, Zachary Fisher, and it, it, originally it was just a desire to carry on his legacy, that it becomes so expansive. And then it became a passion for my wife and I, because Tammy is every bit involved in this as I am. And you can hear it in your voice that it means so much to you. I, I've never been accused of being short on passion as it relates to these men and women but I've seen the best and I've seen the worst. Uh, I, and and it's, it's, I just feel that it's up to us to make sure that we don't forget about what's been done on our behalf. What's been the biggest challenge for you for organizing these games this year? Just keeping my own sanity. <laughs> but you know, in, in a way, I gotta tell you, it's, it's been very interesting because while it's been difficult, and it's been very difficult doing this, because this has never been done on this scale before privately, is realizing on my own the value of family because I would never have been able to do this, to walk down this road without my family to support me. And you know, there, there were, they were not always great conversations. I mean, <laughs> there were times when I would get in the car to go to the airport and my wife Tammy would remind me that I had other responsibilities as well and as, as only she could. But I did remember the value of family and just how you know, important they are. And what's your hope for the future of the Invictus Games? I hope that, that, you know, that when, when the Invictus Games, because eventually they will come to an end, it's, it's not like the Olympics in the sense that you know, the Olympics go on every four years. And you know the wounded now have stopped coming in the numbers that they've they've come, and and so you know it's time you know in in many cases for them to go out now, and you know they've they've come to the end of the road, they've rehabilitated, and and they've done such a wonderful job, and now it's time for them to go out and and get back into the world, and and you know so I I I my 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 biggest hope is that when the Invictus Games come to an end that they come to an end on our terms, if you will, that they don't kind of fizzle out because there was a lack of interest or because we couldn't raise money or because America forgot. That, that's my biggest, my biggest um, desire, I guess. My... Thank you so much. Thank you. When we return, we'll continue our discussion with a veteran who will be competing in the Invictus Games. Stay with us, we'll be right back.
welcome back. With us now is Michael Roggio, who will be taking part in the 2016 Invictus Games. He's a retired Naval Air Crewman. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. How did you first get involved with the Invictus Games? I used um, pool therapy as a way of recovering from uh, breaking my neck, and uh, it eventually turned into me racing people at the pool and uh, really evolved from there. So you are going to be competing in which sport then? I'm, I'm going to be swimming. Now, did, were you a swimmer before? Have you done this all your life? I've never swam competitively prior to the Navy, but in the service I was a uh, rescue swimmer. Any other, any other sports um, appeal to you? I really enjoy competing in track, volleyball, um, cycling. So maybe there's some other, uh, in the future, some <laughs> other uh, uh, competitions that yeah. you will be entering for us with that, yes. How do you learn, though, to adapt and, and play these sports competitively? There's a, there's a whole community of uh, coaches and uh, mentors and everything else that show you different ways to swim or to overcome your injuries and uh, basically to make you inept at your sport. Did you find that um, the term, they use adaptive sports then, so you have coaches for the different types of sports that you want to Definitely. There's a, there's a coach for every variety of sport, and uh, they specialize in different ways to uh, overcome your injury. Like when I first started swimming, I wasn't able to turn my head all the way to the side to breathe, so uh, we came up with different methods, like almost rolling over onto my back in order to breathe. You must work very hard. I do. I do. I train um, every day that I'm able to, and uh, it's been a really intricate part of my recovery to have something to strive for, a new community, everything. Michael, why do you think sports and, and physical challenges make such a difference for recovery? Um, it sounds counterintuitive, but training actually uh, is a vital role in the recovery. It's something to turn to whenever you're training, your body releases endorphins and different things. Uh, it's a lot healthier option than maybe turning to drugs or alcohol, which I feel a lot of uh, veterans that are injured do. Do you think that these games help bring more of an awareness to people, uh, help foster maybe some communication between civilian populations and, and veterans? I do. I think people are seeing people compete maybe with prosthetics or everything else. It's, um, it's drawing a lot more attention to uh, disabled veterans. Michael, do you think that there's a, a gap that needs to be bridged? Do you think people need more awareness of this? Events like this and sporting uh, competitions are a great outlook for uh, disabled veterans. There's a, there's a lot of um, different things out there for getting vets jobs or different things like that, but I think uh, a huge step in recovery is recovering mentally and that this is a great outlet for veterans. And I think that's a good point. It's not just having a physical injury. There's a lot of, of mental aspects here, whether you're just injured or whether it's, it's coming back from seeing some, some really horrific things. So it's mental as well as physical. I would say that mental is the hardest part of recovery. After I was injured, it wasn't the physical aspect, it was the mental aspect. I dealt with uh, depression, something I've never dealt with before. Sports and competing and everything else has been a vital part of my recovery. So what was that trigger though? What made you take that first step to wanting to do this? Um, I was, uh, when I was made aware of adaptive sports and uh, these competitions, it gave me something to strive for, new goals, a new community, a new thing to be a part of, and then uh, it just branched off from there. Now, when you say a new community, do you mean a new set of, of, of friends, military-wise, or just open doors for you in other ways? It's open doors in all kinds of ways. When I was injured, I spent uh, eight months um, in a bed. I, I basically became ostracized from everybody I knew. And uh, even, even after I got up and started walking again and started interacting with people, no one recognized me. I'd lost uh, around 60 pounds and lost all my social connections and everything else. So getting into adaptive sports brought me into a new community, a new set of friends, a new set of goals, and everything else. Now, have you competed? There's, this is the second Invictus Games. Did you compete in the first set? No, this is my first time The first competing. time. So have you done competitions statewide in the um, states? The past three years, I've been uh, competing in uh, the Warrior Games, which last year uh, the British uh, started competing in, 
How fierce is the competition? The competition's extremely fierce. There's um, Olympians and Paralympians and everyone else is competing. And when you look at the times, they're pretty similar to uh, the Olympic times. Oh, that's so, impressive. Yeah, so the competition's pretty high. So the ones that you've done in the States, is the competition uh, among the military branches or among athletes? Is it like Army versus Navy? Or is it just being competitive? It's against the military branches and uh, Britain's team. And it's, uh, it's extremely competitive. It is like Navy versus Army versus Marines versus the British forces. Now, how will that change with the Invictus Games? Is it more a, a team-oriented competition? Because you're, you're really going to be countries like United States versus Canada. Or, so is the competition level a little different? The competition level is very different. It's um, country versus country. So uh, in Invictus, we're going to be competing against 14 other countries. Um, and there's a lot more uh, competition, but also a lot more camaraderie. I see that former President George W. Bush is the honorary chair of the 2016 Games, and he'll be there. What does that mean to you to have the former president part of this? It means a lot. I look at uh, his uh, father's military background and everything that he's done for the military, and uh, I really appreciate him coming out and advocating for us. Prince Harry was the one who started the Games. You know, he seems that he's very involved and, and extremely committed. What does that mean to you? means a lot. I know that uh, Prince Harry has done two tours of duty so he can relate on a personal level and uh, he's actually, from what I understand, who started Invictus in these competitions. Yes. Michael, what do you want people, civilians, to take away from watching these games? I want people to realize that, you know, it doesn't just end at the battlefront, that there's a, there's a fight afterwards, that people are still struggling to reintegrate into society and that there's people may seem fine on the outside but there's still a long road ahead what would you say is the most important message that you and your your teammates want to get out to other veterans who watch the games the most important message is not to give up that uh, to seek out sports or different other physical elements and use that for your recovery and not to turn to uh, other things like uh, drugs or alcohol or even um, medications that might become addicting. Thank you so much and best wishes in the competition. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. That's our show for today. Join us next week when we again explore issues important to Central Florida. Thanks for watching. I'm Diane Trees.